All right, it's two o'clock. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you guys for being here. It's always appreciated. Um, this week, we are covering the last three sections of Unit 2, which is very exciting. Um, so you've got Quiz 9, Discussion Board 8. Um, the numbering is off because, again, this is a 12-week class. Um, discussion Board 9 is due next week, kind of at a weird time, um, because next week is exam week. So um, if you haven't already scheduled exam two, remember that is due um, the 11th at noon. If you are at a proctoring site that is not open on Saturday, make sure you have it done by Friday. Um, and hopefully you're working on project two as well. So a little bit of everything um, due this week. Uh, one thing I want to throw in right now while I'm thinking of it, um, next week is exam week. And so our session that would normally take place on Tuesday at two would be a question answer session. Um, unfortunately, I will be unavailable next Tuesday. I will be in Texas. Um, and therefore, we will not have any class next week at all. Um, I mean, I can't do it on Monday because I'm traveling to Texas. I can't do it on Wednesday because I'm traveling back from Texas. Um, so really, I would be available Thursday and Friday of next week. Um, but many of you will probably already have taken your exam. So with that being said, uh, Amy, Christian, Kara, Trent, you guys are here. Um, if you have any questions or you would like a session Thursday or Friday, um, shoot me an email or, or speak up now and we can you know, plan something for Thursday or Friday. Um, but I am unavailable Monday through Wednesday next week. So, um, but you have all of the exam prep stuff in IV Learn. Um, and I, I will be available to drink, uh, through email. I will be emailing Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday um, in between events. So um, if you need me, I'm definitely here for you. I just will not be available for a live session um, Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday. So, and you can decide on Tuesday of next week of, man, I'm really stuck on this section. I could use a discussion. Can we do it on Thursday? Shoot me an email. We will set it up and we'll go from there. Okay, so Thursday or Friday, I'm here for you. Pick a time. I can make it work. Um, just not Monday through Wednesday. Okay, any questions about anything through 15 uh, before we jump into section 16? Anybody? Okay, uh, well, if you have questions, as usual, feel free to unmute and speak or go ahead and throw them in the chat box, whatever is easiest for you. Um, kind of a preview, section six, whoops, wrong button. Section 16 and 17 go together a little bit. We talk about probability. Um, 16 is where we really get comfortable with the uh, finding probability. And then 17 is uh, where we are going to build probability tables before we actually find the probability. And then 18 is kind of its own beast. So um, 16 and 17 go together and 18 is just eh, whatever. So let's go ahead and get into this. Um, so when we're talking about probability, you know, probability is the chance that something can happen. And, and really, we can write probability as a fraction, as a decimal, or as a percent. So when you are doing your homework in web work, please, please, please pay attention to the directions. Um, because when it asks for probability, right, it can be in any of these forms, fraction, decimal, or percent. So you want to make sure you pay attention to how does web work want it. If it says to the nearest tenth of a percent, then you need to wrap, you know, change it to a percent and then round. That kind of thing. But how do we find probability? You know, I always say probability is what we want to happen over our total possibilities. So if that's kind of how I, I think about it when I'm reading these problems, and you'll see some examples as we work through, um, you know, you think about your total possibilities, and then out of those possibilities, what do we want to have happen? The want is the numerator. So generally, our probabilities will always start as a fraction, and then we will move them to a decimal and or a percent. Now, some rules about probability. You must be between 0 and 1. And if you think about this, if we're talking about, you know, um, rolling a die, right, heads or tails, well, think about heads, right? you got a 50-50 chance of flipping a heads, right? So you've got a 50% chance of it being heads, 50, well, 50% 50 chance of being tails. If you look at these, both of these are between 0 and 1, right? 50-50 chance. The more pieces you have to split up, you know, it might, it's going to change the probability. But the basic thing is that if you have a probability of 0, that means that this can never happen. So like the probability of taking a math class without homework, 0, right? You're definitely going to have homework. 
probability of one means it's always going to happen or it's definitely going to happen. So the probability of taking a math class with homework is one, right? That's definitely going to happen. And then everything in between, the never always, those are kind of the two sides of this extreme and everything else is in between. When you look at that second bullet where it says the sum of all probabilities is one, well, if I go back to my heads and tails, if I add those together, I get one. And that goes back to thinking about percent. We know if we talk about everything as percents, that's 100%. And so if you break up the different pieces, you might have 30% and 20% and 20% and 30. If you add them all together, you get 100%. And as a decimal, 100% is one. And then the probability of an event, that's kind of what I talked about up here, what we want to happen over the total possibilities. All right, let's go ahead and jump into finding some of these probabilities. So we're going to start um, with kind of a general question. We're going to roll a six-sided die. What is the probability of rolling a number greater than one? Okay, so what we want is a number greater than one. So a number greater than one is my numerator, and the total is a six-sided die, right? So kind of thinking just in terms of words. Well, if you're thinking about a six-sided die, how many numbers are greater than one on a six-sided die? You guys know what a six-sided die is, right? It's got numbers one, two, three, four, five, and six. So it's got six numbers on it. How many of those numbers are greater than one? Five. Thank you. All right. So five numbers are greater than six. There are six numbers total, so our probability would be five-sixths. Very good. Okay. Let's go ahead and change that to a decimal. What is five-sixths as a decimal? Point eight three, fantastic. And so, what is that as a percent? Eighty three percent, very good. All right. So that's kind of basic probability using just information. Well, most of this class is going to be spent using probability tables. So you can see the probability tables, we've got columns and we've got rows and we've got information. So use the table below. What is the probability someone likes red? To begin here, I always like to think about my, my probabilities as words. So uh, the probability that somebody likes red. Well, that means I want red and it just wants probability that someone, that means I'm looking out of the total. Well. How many total reds do we have? Total red is 18, very good, right? Because red total is here. And then how many total, total people do we have? Overall totals. Eighty exactly. So as a fraction, this would be eighteen over eighty. Now the issue with fractions is that you have to reduce them. Well, I don't want to work that hard. So how can I change this? Let's go ahead and just change it to a decimal. So what is eighteen over eighty as a decimal? Point two two five. Very good which would be 22.5%. So we would have a 22.5% chance of picking somebody who likes red based off of this data. Okay, have I lost anybody yet? Hopefully not. Okay, so basic probability generally is, is not too bad. Okay, you guys go ahead and find this one. Give me as a fraction um, and a decimal.
You can go ahead and put it in the chat box if you'd like when you're done. Very good. So if we're talking females, right? 40 out of 80. So there's, you know, your fraction. Um, and as a decimal, that would be 0.5 or 50%. Very good. I think you guys all had that. Very good. All right. Very straightforward. We're talking about someone. So we're talking about out of the total and we wanted females. All right. So now we're going to add a little bit of a crinkle to it. So we're still probably cho choosing, now we're probably of choosing a male who likes purple. So now we're kind of focusing on more of a select group. Now we don't want just female, but we want a male who likes purple. So how many males who like purple do we have? So we want males who like purple over the total. Yep, so male purple, we find the intersection. Uh, often you will see, excuse me, the word and, choosing a male and someone who likes purple. So a lot of times the word and is in there. So we have 10 over 80, male who likes purple. And that would be 0.125 or 12.5%. Okay, again, that's and. And means the intersection. So if I would draw males and purple, the spot where they intersect would be your numerator. Okay, okay so and, that's one special case. Now let's get to an or. Or is different than and, right? So and means both things have to happen. Whereas when we're talking about the word or, it doesn't have to be both things. It can be just one. So when I'm looking at this problem, probably choosing a female or somebody who likes red. Now, depending on your table, if the table is small enough, you can just count. If you have a bigger table, sometimes it's difficult. So what I like to, to talk about is or implies addition. So you'll see we're talking about females. So if I'm finding the probability, I want fem oops, female, wrong. female over the total or tells me to add. So or is add someone who likes red plus the red over the total. Now, if you look at this, here are my females. Here are, here are the reds. So if I add my females of 40 over 80 plus my reds of 18 over 80, I counted this number twice. It was counted in both the total of my females and in the total of the reds. So I will subtract the overlap, which is the females who like red. So my overlap is the six over 80 because there's no reason for me to count it twice. So as a fraction, 40 plus 18 is 58 minus six gives me 52 over 80. which as a decimal is 0.65. Now, if you see it, you know, I, I like to talk about, you know, how to think through these problems, because if you get to a word problem without a table, you need to understand that or tells you to add and subtract the overlap. Um, if you're just looking at this, at this problem here, you could say, well, red and female, these are just the four numbers I need. Oh, that's a bad color, blue on blue. Sorry about that. So if we would say 12 plus the 6 plus 26 plus 8, that is also 52 out of 80. So whether you just count those spots or you do the females plus red minus female red, either way you get to the same answer, right? Mathematically, it's the same. Okay, questions about or? or and, either one of those. Am I going too fast? Am I going too slow? Are we okay? Thoughts? None. Okay, care is good. Per we got a perfect, oh, thank you. You're so sweet, Amy. Okay, here we go. So let's erase. 
Now we're going to talk about what we call conditional probabilities. So you say, well, what is the probability of choosing someone who, who, like, who likes blue given it is a female? Given this word can also be if, if it is a female. So given and if are kind of used interchangeably. Um, but what happens here is that we are saying, you know what, we know it's a female. Given that it's a female. That means we only care about this area here. We only care about the females because that's what it says. Given it's a female, what's the probability somebody likes blue? So when you see this word given or the word if, that changes your denominator. You're no longer looking out of the total for everybody. Now you're looking out of the total just of the females. So my denominator is going to be 40 because that's how many females I have. And what do we want? We want the blues. So blue, female, 26. So my fraction is 26 over 40, which, just like our last answer, would be 0.65. So it's really important that you read the questions very carefully. And if you've got to differentiate between or and and, uh, you need to recognize if you are given a conditional, meaning, you know, if it's a female, if it's a male, if the person likes blue, all of that fun stuff. Those are all different conditional probabilities. So. Okay. Uh, yeah, there you go. That's section 16 in a nutshell, right? We did basically one of each type of probability, and that's it. So now we shall jump into uh, section 17, which is kind of an application of probability if you will. So in section 17, you're not going to be given the tables. You're going to have to create the tables. That's kind of the big difference between section 16 and section 17. So first off, section 17 blows us into the world of false positives and false negatives, which are mostly seen in the medical world. I would say for the most part, right? So an example, a false positive is when you test positive but it's wrong. So if I would go right now and take a pregnancy test and it would come out positive, I'd be like, oh my God, I'm pregnant, which would be scary. Um, but in all actuality, I'm really not. So it's a false positive. So the key to these is that the word attached to this tells you how you tested. A false positive means you tested positive, but it's false. A false negative means you tested negative, but it's wrong. So if I would go to the doctor today and they would say, Becky, you tested negative for strep throat. Go ahead and go home. You're fine. However, I totally do have strep throat, right? So they told me I was fine, but I'm not. So false positive, false negatives do happen. It's just super important that you remember that the word tells you how you tested, okay? That's kind of your basic overall, overall definition of false positive, false negative. So the table. Okay, so we, um, this first page here, we are going to create the table. Um, we're going to walk through it a little bit. We only do one example here in our class, live class, um, but I have a ton of videos of doing multiple examples in this, this section. And really, the more you do, the easier they get. If you can't find the videos and you don't know, or if you want extra ones, um, just shoot me an email. I will send you the links personally um, because really it is a lot easier when you just work through um, quite a bit. In web work, uh, you will have to make tables for most of the problems in web work for this section. And, you know, if, if you mess up your table, you're not going to be able to get the probability questions correct. So if you have questions or you're stuck on one, it's really best if you can take a picture of your table and send it to me because then I can figure out where you're going wrong. Without your table, it's hard for me to help you from a distance. So if you can submit a picture, it's very, very helpful uh, for me to be able to help you. Okay, so let's get started. Um, made up data here, fake news. 3% of people are allergic to snakes. A test with 92% accuracy can be used to test for this allergy. We're going to use a sample of 50,000 to create a table and then once we have this table created, we will answer questions A through D. So it will be beneficial if you guys write this table down so that when we move forward um, A through D, you have the table in front of you um, because my table will be gone for those questions. So, okay. So first things first, you will always do this total column first. 
So this piece here is always the first part that you create. Um, we know we're taking 50,000 total. And that's kind of a, a made up number. It doesn't really matter how many you start with. Um, because we're dealing with percents, the probability will be the same whether we started with 50,000 here or 10,000. It really wouldn't matter. But I have 50,000 people. Do any of you have any idea where to go? I mean, we got to do these two spots. So which one do we start with? And any idea on what number we play with first? There you go, Kara. We know that 3% of people have the allergy, right? They say that here in the very, very first piece. So 3% of the people. Well, we have 50,000 people. So 3% is 0 0.03, and we're going to multiply that by 50,000. And this is how many have the allergy. So this is our first line. So 3% times 50,000 gives me what? 1,500. Perfect. Okay, so that number is 1,500. Now, think through it. If you have 50,000 total people and 1,500 of them have the allergy, what does that lead you to? Exactly. So we would take the 50,000 minus the 1,500 and that gives us the 48,500 people who do not have the allergy. All right. Stop me if you have questions. So we've got our total. Now, what I call the inside four, because these four boxes are inside, this is where the accuracy rate comes in. And it's where a little bit of common sense also comes into play. So think about this. If you have the allergy, that's where we're going to start. You have this allergy. If you go in to take a test, would you expect to test positive or negative if you know you have the allergy? You would expect to test positive, exactly. So the accuracy is in this box because if you have it, you expect to test positive. So 92%, which is 0.92 as a decimal, of the people who have it, 1,500, will test positive because that's what should happen. Accuracy rate is what should happen. So 92% of our allergic to snake people will test positive. And that gives us 1,380. So if I know 1,380 of them will test positive, how do I figure out how many will test negative? Exactly. We've got 1,500 people who ha have the allergy, 1,380 of them test positive, so 120 of them test negative. Yeah. And if you, it's kind of like a puzzle. I mean, one piece leads to the next piece. Um, all right, so that's my allergic people. Now I go to my not allergic people. And think about it again. If I don't have the allergy and you test me, I expect to test negative because I don't have it. If I don't have it, I should test negative. That's where the accuracy rate comes in. So again, 92% times the 48,500 people who do not have the allergy, 92% of them are going to test negative. And that is 44,620. And just like the last one, if I had 48,500 people, and 44,620 of them tested negative, then the rest of them are going to test positive to the number of 3,880. Make that eight. Okay. Anybody have any questions on the inside four? What's my last step in this table?
Just add your totals. Exactly. Exactly. So if we go ahead and total them up, 5260, 44740. And you should always just take a second when you add those two totals, just add them together and make sure you get 50,000. Um, if you had, you know, typed a number in wrong or something, uh, you don't want to, you know, jack up your whole table just because you added incorrectly. Okay. Any questions on creating this table? Because you are going to have to create this table for every homework problem in section 17. Some of them are challenge problems in web work. They're a little more difficult. Um, please reach out and ask any questions. I'm, I'm here to help. That is what I'm here for. Um, just again, make sure you send me a picture because it's easiest for me to help you with a picture. Okay. All right. So if no questions over the table, let's go ahead and move on to the next page. So I kept my work here, kind of. Um, oh, crap. Crapper, crapper, crapper. Okay, so we have has the disease, does not have the disease. Here are the positive tests, here are the negative tests. Okay. And there's the totals. Okay, so we have our table, and I wanted to do this on, pur on, on purpose. I will erase it for the next questions. Um, but we're talking about section or 7A. How many false positives are there? So remember, a false positive means you tested positive, but it's wrong. So if you tested positive, that's this line. Which one of those numbers, if you tested positive, is wrong? Nope, tested positive, not has the disease, tested positive, right? A false positive means you tested positive. So it's the gray circled piece, right? It's only the positive testers. And remember, if you test positive, you expect to have the disease. If you test positive and you do not have the disease, that would be incorrect, right? So 3880 is the false positive. Because you tested positive, so we're in the positive testing line, but it's wrong, right? You don't have it. So that's the false positive. In letter B, it says, how many false negatives are there? Well, now we're talking about the negatives. So we're looking at the negative column. And again, if you are negative, you test negative, you would expect to not have it. So that makes sense. This is what we call a true negative. If I test negative, I shouldn't have it. If I test negative and I do have it, that's the wrong part. So the false negative would be 120. Okay. Do you see the difference between false positive and false negative on the table? Okay. All right. Now that my table is sufficiently horrible, I'm going to erase it. Hopefully you guys have this written down. And we're going to go to 7C. Given a positive test result, what is the probability someone does not have the allergy? Key word here is given. Given a positive test result. That means that's all we care about. We only care about the positive tests. So that's my denominator, positive tests. The numerator, someone who does not have the allergy. Okay, so on your table, you're focusing only on the column of positive tests. How many total positive tests do we have? Good, 5260. That's our total positive tests. How many of them, so you're still looking at just that column, how many in that column do not have the allergy? Thirty-eight eighty, exactly. And there's your fraction. Thirty-eight eighty over fifty-two sixty. Change that to a decimal for me, please. Thank you. 
2.74, I'll take it. Again, make sure you read the directions um, when it comes to web work and when you get to your second exam about what to round to, because that's great too. Right now, it really doesn't matter. Okay, using your same table, do 7D. Use the same table to answer 7D. Let's go fraction and a decimal, please. Ooh, Kara, you found the other one. So we kind of... Yes, Amy, you are correct. Okay, so let's look at why it is what it is. So when we're reading this problem through, given... Ooh, I need a pen. Given a negative test result, right? So we're only looking at the negative testers. So the negatives go on the bottom. What is probably that someone does have the allergy? So does have the allergy. Oh, yep. See, there's your detail. Yep. Very good. Well, so you would have been right with the other one because I, I could tell by you, you had the compliment, ooh, which I did not talk about. That's right. Okay, so negative, we had a total of 40, 40, 7, 40, 44, 7, 40 and 120 on the top. So as Amy mentioned, 0 0.0026, you might have rounded that to 0 0.003, something in that neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So that's section 17. Um, you know, you're, so in the, the questions, you know, in web work, you know, this will be the question that you're trying to answer, but the information that you're given is the, is, is like the, the question for D. 3% of people are allergic to snakes, blah, blah, blah. What percent, you know, given that it's a negative test, we get. Well, in order to answer the question, <coughs> excuse me, you're going to have to create the entire table. So you have to make that way you have the correct numbers in the correct spot. Okay. Any other questions over section 17? Okay, so just remember section 17. Send me your work if you need help. All right, so in section um, 18, um, basically we have one long problem in section 18. That's that's kind of how 18 rolls, uh, and it's very much terminology. So we're going to start with talking about the population versus the sample, and there's a very big difference between these two. They are related, um, but there's a very, very big difference. So when you think about section 18, okay, so get out of probability mode. So turn that off and get ready for something completely different, right? So this has nothing to do with probability with section 16 and 17. So when you're thinking about section 18, we're talking about doing a survey or a poll. So if you were thinking about you know, presidential election, and you are, uh, you want to go out and you want to talk to people about whether or not they think things, whatever. The population is all the people that you could talk to. So maybe you only want to talk to people who can vote, so you only want to talk to adults, 
right? So my population would be all adults. I can't spell. There's an L in there. All adults. Because it's all possible people you could talk to. Keyword there is all. So the population is all possibilities. Kind of giving you some alliteration there to help you remember. So if you think about, you know, I want to talk about people who can vote. So, you know, all the adults. Well, what's the likelihood that you're going to actually talk to all the adults? Well, you can't. Right? There are 320 some million people in America, and a lot of them are adults. There's no way you can talk to all of them. So the sample is the actual number that you talk to. So maybe you decide that you're going to talk to 400 adults. So the sample would be 400 adults. Oops, again, I forgot my L. So the population is all the possible people you could talk to. The sample is the number that you actually do talk to. Do you see the difference? Population is the possibility. The sample is the actual. Okay. Okay, good. Thank you, Amy. I appreciate the reinforcement. Then we go to the margin of error. Well, you can imagine you're talking to a group of people to make a... Um, a statement about the entire population, right? I'm going to talk to 400 people and then I'm going to say, out of these 400 people, right, 30% think that Becky should be president. Well, you're going to have some error because you only talk to a small group. So the margin of error is kind of the plus or minus. If you think about um, things that you've seen either in the paper or on the news and it talks about, you know, plus or minus 3%, that's a margin of error. The margin of error is found by taking 1 divided by the square root of n. And that little piece right there is on your formula sheet that is in your packet, right, page 245. You will have a blank one of those available when you go to take your test, right? Uh, or I shouldn't say a blank one, a clean one will be provided to you by the testing center. Okay, so this n is the sample size. So for this particular example where I said our sample was 400, we would find the margin of error by taking 1 over the square root of 400. And let's go ahead and do this just for fun to make sure that we all know how to use our calculator. This one comes up very nicely. depending on your calculator, might depend on how you type it in. Yeah, carrot is 0 0.05. Um, if your calculator is not great with square roots, you might have to find the square root of 400 first, which is 20, and then take 1 divided by 20. You might have to do it in a couple steps, and that's fine. So 0 0.05, we would say our margin of error is 5%. Okay. So to continue on this first example, I'm going to make the general statement that um, 30, we're just going to use that, 30% of people think Becky should be president. Whoops, I can't spell should either. By the way, I would never want to be president. It's a job I will never apply for. All right, so we have this given statement. We talked to 400 people. We got a margin of error of 5%. Then we can create a 95% confidence interval. And that's taken by, we call this the point estimate, right, the information given. So we take our 30%, and then we say plus or minus 5%, because our error, right, we can be wrong 5% in either direction. So what would be the low end? The low end would be 30% minus 5%. So what's 30 minus 5? 25. So the low end of my confidence interval would be 25%. The high end would be 30 plus 5, which is 35%. So your confidence interval is kind of this range. And what that means is if you would go out and talk to people, and it doesn't matter how many, if you went out and talked to a group of people, you would expect that between 25 and 35% of those people would say that Becky should be president. That's what you're trying to say. That's the purpose of a confidence interval. And that, oh, look at that. I just actually answered the question, confidence interval. And then we could write a meaningful sentence. And just because I 
kind of talked about that, I will. So our meaningful sentence would be something like, we are 95% confident. And yes, you have to say that you're 95% confident because that's the confidence level we are using in this course. We are only using 95% confident. If you would take a straight up stats course statistics, you would talk about confidence levels of any, any percent, 80%, 85%, 92%, 98%. We talk about confidence levels of all types in a stats class. So in here, we are 95% confident that between 25% and 35, oops, forgot five, 35% of adults think Becky should be president. And that's what this meaningful sentence is all about. Okay. All right. How we doing? Okay. Okay, good. All right. All right, I'm going to go ahead and erase this page. Everybody's, I hope everybody's okay with that. And then we're going to move on to our last example of the day. So, a recent survey of 2,400 U.S. adults found that 36% of adults think the Cubs are overrated. And, of course, this is completely made-up data, made up by me. I am not a Cubs fan. Okay, so I'm going to give you two minutes, maybe three, um, to kind of see what you can answer of these five questions, right? If you don't know any of them, that's fine. Just kind of think through the problem. We're going to be two minutes. Oops, wrong button. And then we will talk about them. Okay? So, go. Okay. You guys need more time or you feel good? Okay, let's go ahead and chat. So let's start with population. What is the population here? Excellent. Very good. All U.S. adults. Right? That's what it says, U.S. adults. Don't just say all adults because that includes Germans and Russians and Australians and Canadians. No. They're just U.S. adults. Very good. Okay, what is the sample? 2,400. Very good. Margin of error. How do we find the margin of error? One over. It's hard to do square roots on the chat box. I got it. So one over the square root of 2,400. What did you get for that? Very good, 0 0.02. And then notice, since they talk about 36%, right, this is our point estimate, so we need to change the 0 0.02 to a percent. So what is 0 0.02 as a percent? 2%, perfect. So there's my margin of error. So far, so good. Very good, everybody. Confidence interval. How do we find our confidence interval? Plus or minus the margin of error. Very good. So we take our point estimate of 36%, and then we plus or minus the 2%. So 36 minus 2 is 34. 36 plus 2 is 38. So this is my 95% confidence interval. And then we go to the statement using your answer to part D. So we are 95% confident that between 
34% and 38% of U.S. adults, right, there's our population, U.S. adults, um, think the Cubs are overrated. There you go. So you're always 95% confident. You always include your confidence interval, your population, and then what these people are doing. And that's it. So who has questions for me? All right, Kara says she's good. Good for now, that's good, right? You can always ask me later for questions, that's great. Um, so remember, if you haven't done so already, schedule your exam. Um, and remember, next week there will be no live session through Wednesday. If you need me Thursday or Friday, you just have to ask, and I'll make magic happen. Um, otherwise, I'm always available through email, so please you know, reach out if you need me. Um, but keep working hard. I appreciate the effort you guys are putting in. And uh, I'm here for you if you need me. So just let me know. Okay. Thanks for coming. Thanks for participating. I appreciate it.